Let's see if I can get through this without the phone ringing. Uh, I usually don't show my face. I think people who show their face on YouTube are um, irresponsible for their own safety and health. Um, and because of my safety and health, I really would never do that. But they know who I am, they know what I look like, and they know where I live. And so they meaning, you know, people that I don't like me. How does it be? And one thing I noticed in, in the webcam, you know, I have a chipped tooth that I just chipped. And it looks, you know, like a scene out of Deliverance or something. It's kind of mortifying and frightening how, how well it shows up. Uh, so try to ignore. I, I try to talk like this, um, but um, there's a lot going on. Um, I have not slept in three days. Uh, we'll spare you the long story. I have a client that I was taking care of, and he was actually a friend. We had him on. Uh, he was he had a metastatic breast, uh, lung cancer, many lesions in the brain. Very difficult situation. You know, you want to titrate his his vitamin C infusions, his ozone up. You start low, work high. If, if you kill off too many tumors in the brain, it'll kill him. And if you let him progress, it'll kill him. So what a, what a fine line. He was making great progress. He did develop a bleed, which I told him he had a bleed. Um, he, he had developed signs of a stroke, left-sided weakness. He fell a little bit. Um, and uh, I told him he was bleeding. Of course, he went to the ER and they scanned him. And mm, I was right was bleeding so that told me I was I mean I was expecting um, the tumor to start letting go one of the tumors some of the tumors to start letting go um, we we got to that threshold and one let go so now I told him you got to back off you got to back off your therapies until that bleed resi resolves so he did he backed off the bleed resolved and um, you sometimes they seizure when this happens but, but once the tumor gets cleaned up by the body's own processes and this stuff reabsorbs and gets distributed, the irritation in the brain goes away and the patient recovers. And so that's uh, what was happening and he did recover. He had some speech disturbances that were the best I've ever heard on Saturday. And so he was almost back to normal. I was still telling him not to get infusions, not to get chemo. If we kill these off too quickly, you will die. It's very dangerous. I feel great. I feel great. Oh, it's the best I've ever felt. Yeah, but you're on seizure medication now. So you're not great. You got 20 tumors in your brain. You're not great. You feel great, but you're not great. So Saturday he went and didn't tell his naturopath what was going on. The naturopath gave him a full dose of therapy. Four hours later, he starts seizuring. I called the family. I said, he's having tumor cell die off. Get him to the emergency room. I race to the emergency room. I tell the ER doctor he's having a process called apoptosis, which is a type of cell lysis, a rupturing of the cell in the brain. I said, if that's the case, um, his lactic acid will be high. And so what does she do? She tests the lactic acid, and guess what? I was right again. Lactic acid high. I said that'll come down in three days. The vitamin C will flush out very quickly. That's the one blessing about it. If you have a reaction, it flushes out quickly. Doesn't stay in the bloodstream like like the Taxol does. Um, when I needed it to get out of my bloodstream and stop turning over cancer cells, stop spilling the protein that my body was attacking, and then all of a sudden my body goes haywire and attacks all the protein that's floating in my body, which is like every single square inch of my body. Whoa, I got more than I bargained for, but it all goes to science. So now, three days later, lactic acid comes down, his seizures, very, very um, troubling and disturbing for the family, disturbing for me to see. They had him on four different seizure medications, but I needed him to be snowed. I needed him to be just unconscious. And three days, he kept trying to climb out of bed, get me out of here, get me out of here. He was talking. I walked in Monday. He looked at me, and he called me by name four times. Get me out of here. Let's go. Let's go. Because he knew, he knew what was going to happen if he stayed. They were going to call it progression, and they were going to keep him sedated, and he would not wake up. And he knew that. 
and he was trying to climb over the rails. He was trying to tear out his IVs. They had to put him in restraints. He was trying to bite staff. And the whole time he's saying, calling me by name, saying, get me out of here. Get me out of here. I feel good. Get me out of here. Well, so they finally got him snowed, and he's finally sleeping after three days. The guy's exhausted. I am exhausted. And so now the doctor wants him on hospice. He said this could be progression. We finally did an MRI. The MRI showed there's something in one, the other side of the brain. It could have been a microbleed, or it could have been a new tumor. A new tumor they would call progression. Progression of a guy with 20 tumors in the brain it means hospice. So I'm saying, give the guy 24 hours. Give him, and then, and then his seizures decreased, but he still had constant seizuring in one part of the brain, that, that part where they said was progression. And so I'm lobbying for another 24 hours. Just give him another 24 hours. He's sedated. He's comfortable. He's in a great place. Let's just give him another 24 hours. Give him the benefit of the doubt. He spent a ton of money to, to get to this point. I warned you it could come to this. Let's see if he clears. No, no, he wouldn't want to be like this. So the family couldn't hurry any fast enough to put him on hospice. Nobody listened to me, even though I was right about everything. So no sleep, bags under my eyes. And I, I look at my picture, and I, I, my chip tooth looks like somebody out of deliverance. Um, but I want you to see what I look like. Everybody wants to know. Now, there's so much going on that I need to talk about. Um, part of this, the, the video, video is going to cut out. I'm going to narrate over some images. But I want to talk to you about it, the sense, some of the censorship that you're going to be seeing in the next few months. I went to validate, you know, the changes in planetary position. I wanted to see if the planets were coming back into alignment, if their 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 you know their up and down motions uh, were softening. Remember, Venus was setting at 10:30 at night a few years ago. Remember that at 2020, um, Venus was so high in the sky, uh, we thought it was a jet plane, right? And and it was setting at 10:30 p.m on the western horizon. Wow, it was no longer the evening star, it was almost the midnight star. Well, lo and behold, mm. so what are they going to do? What are they going to do about that? Well, so you try to look up the definition of declination and inclination, and you should be able to type in, what is the difference? And it used to be very short and sweet. Declination is the measure of the angle of a celestial body in relationship to Earth's equator. The plane of Earth's equator, which is tilted. So some, during night or day, something could be below or above this, this tilt of the equator. But when you look out in the sky, do you know where the equatorial plane is? No, nobody does. They put it to you, plain and simple. Declination is the relationship of a celestial body with relationship to the Earth's equatorial plane. Now we go to inclination. Where do you find anywhere now on the internet? Look, do this. Do this yourself. Where do you find anywhere on the internet where it says inclination is relationship of a celestial body with relationship to the ecliptic? Well, we all know where the ecliptic is. Regulus is on the ecliptic. Certain stars are on the ecliptic. Certain constellations like Pleiades are just, you know, four degrees off the ecliptic. The moon, the sun, define the ecliptic. So if you want to see that the moon's off and it's supposed to be five degrees above the ecliptic today and it's occulting Regulus, you know something's wrong, right? You know something's off, right? So here we go. Can't find, can't find that definition. Can't find it. I'm sure it's there. But now all the definitions, even in Wikipedia, are so complicated. They're talking about right ascension and longitude. Well, I look up in the sky. I don't know what right ascension and longitude is. Do you? No, of course you don't. And so, you know, I, I, could, I could put my two fingers out in front of me, and the two fingers are four degrees. One finger is two degrees. I could, I could get a rough estimate on how far something is ventured from the ecliptic by just using the reference stars. Well, 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 well. 
You know, and also, you know, there are planets out there that have very little inclination. Um, so relationship to the moon, to those planets, like Jupiter, um, can tell you, they're, you know, they're supposed to be in not a very big difference between the paths of those celestial bodies across your sky. So somebody, obviously, took the definition and the difference between inclination and declination and surely clouded the topic, didn't they? Search for it. I, I mean, you might find it. If you, if you find, um, you know, inclination is the position related to the ecliptic, if you find that definition, uh, get a link and send it to me. Attach it in the comment section. So also, the censorship tornadoes, you know. Ten years ago, we said tornadoes were going to get worse. Five years ago, we said tornadoes are going to get worse. And some of the things you have to be careful about when trying to validate, validate that is th the numbers they're using. Uh, I caught one um, article talking about total numbers, but they left out EF1s. You know, and you have 100 EF1s, all of them get washed, washed off your total. Uh, how good a total is that? Another one was measuring just EF5s. Well, uh, uh, that doesn't tell you how your tornado season went. Uh, one of them w talked about the most destructive. One of them talked about the greatest tornado swarm, the greatest tornado o outbreak over a two-day period. They're not measuring the entire season. All of these are skewed. All of None of them are accurate in terms of grabbing the grabbing the the total number of tornadoes and this the degree of severity of these tornadoes so we got something about the tornadoes in 2021 finally we got something about the earthquakes uh, we had some seven pointers we're having a cluster right now we're falling into a jupiter alignment we're going to be talking about that as well um, so for what it's worth, here's my ugly face. Um, congratulations, Patreon. That's my treat to you and my treat to my enemies. They know how handsome I really am. Until next time, uh, thank you for listening. And we're going to now narrate some images. S in 2021, something happened. A record was broken. And it was broken by a lot. One tornado was on the ground for 220 miles. When people talk about manufactured weather. Keeping a tornado on the ground for 200 miles is a long, long way. Imagine hopping on the freeway, driving 60 miles an hour for um, almost four hours. That's how long the tornado was on the ground. I find it hard to believe that that's a natural occurrence based upon the way the speed and the way these systems travel. But, you know, stranger things have happened because our wind speeds in the upper atmosphere are changing and, and the temperature deltas, the changes in temperature between one front and another can be very extreme, causing incredible instability. And coming up before you will be some of that Mayfield tornado images and the storm track because 57 people died and it just was a clear cut path of destruction and EF4 well people say well we didn't have any EF5s in 2022 or 20 but the you know but yet we had an EF4 that was on the ground for hours and hours and hours it seemed like it would just never go away and tornadoes are supposed to be a little shorter lived so basically what we're talking about is that there was a record set back in 1925 where a tornado was on the ground for, for you know, hundreds of miles. Well, 1925 was, again, a climate shift right before the Dust Bowl, so where we had heat and drought. Um, and you know, I, I want to go back and study that and see if it was planetary-related or solar system-related cycle. But the Mayfield tornado... 220 miles on the ground smashed the record. Another thing happened in 2021. The amount of December tornadoes doubled. I mean, 
it doubled the record. It didn't double the average, it doubled a record. Now records are hard to break. Why? Because they're records. Hello? And so when you double your record, that screams change. It screams that something is not normal. We are going through or somebody is manipulating the weather. Either or, it requires your attention. It requires your diligence and your vigilance. It requires you to be extra, extra alert about things like this. And when the number of December hurricane, when, you know, December, it's winter. It's traditionally not a hurricane month, but now it is. December didn't used to be a fire month, but now it is. Some of our most outrageous fires have happened in November and December. So hurricane seasons, tornado outbreaks, fire seasons are all extending because of one thing, heat. They'll blame carbon dioxide. We've proven over and over and over again, carbon dioxide is not the culprit, it's the solar irradiance. The Earth is heating, but so are all the other planets and all of their moons. Every planet is undergoing atmospheric change and Earth is not exempt. But so, and then when you try to like compare tornadoes, because we, we told you tornadoes were going to, the, the frequency, the number was going to go up, the severity was going to go up, and people try to mislead you. One list talks about what is the most catastrophic tornadoes. Oh, yeah, you know, well, you know, the catastrophe is dependent upon where the tornado happens. If it happens out in the middle of the desert, there's no damage. But if it happens in the middle of town, there's extensive damage. So you can't tell anything by going by catastrophic damage and the cost. You can't even do it by the number of lives lost. You really have to do it by tornado strength and tornado number. But when you start leaving out EF1s out of your count, or you're just only looking at EF5s, you're going to skew the entire picture. And that's what's happening with you try to, you know, research tornadoes. Here's the article about um, the tornadoes um, in 2021. I mean, it's, and 2021 was a cruel year. And, and it was just amazing how the, you know, doubling the previous record in December, uh, that's incredible. The year ended on a destructive note, doubling the, the, the record for December. 227 miles, almost 230 miles. This Mayfield tornado was on the ground. And it, that is just, it still blows my mind how a tornado can stay so well organized, not lift up, not disintegrate, not fall apart for 220 miles. When you look at the weather map, I mean, this is what's going on. Uh, South America is off to the lower right, completely covered in rain and snow. The, the equator is supposed to be right along that line. There is no equator. There is no equatorial belt of water. It has gone, and it will reform, but when it does, it's very temporary. When we look at, at what's happening, um, it's easy to see that we, we see almost all the weather traversing from left to right. This is the Atlantic. You see uh, an equatorial belt of water uh, very thin, uh, right off the coast of Brazil, you see massive, massive rain in Brazil, South America, but the equatorial belt of water is going in the wrong direction. Hello? And you see where on the top we have le left to right tr traverse, what used to be our jet stream, but now the equatorial belt is going left to right, and it's creating this spinning motion, and there's a big blob of moisture over the Atlantic Ocean. A blob. Um, again, in the southern hemisphere, we see well-defined circular circulation in the upper atmosphere, almost creating an eye in the upper atmosphere. 
and eyes usually only form in hurricanes, which are in the lower atmosphere. We look over what's going over the United States and we see that weather fronts that are kicking up these tornadoes as it starts to exit. We see a high speed of moisture flowing uh, to the north. This pattern has been playing out for two years now. It won't, will not shift. And then we look at the, what's plunging in to the east west coast. I mean, at incredible speed. The, the arm of water is not coming from the equator. It's actually coming down from the Arctic, sparing us that hot rain that we were warning you about. But one day in April, it's going to rain on a snowpack. And when that happens, hold on to your hats. Now we had a bunch of earthquakes. We're, we're experiencing an earthquake cluster now. We experienced an earthquake cluster, the Turkey earthquake, when Earth aligned 90 degrees to the Sun and planet X, which would be at the top of your screen. So that alignment really doesn't pertain right now. But what pertains is the beginning of the Jupiter-Sun Earth alignment and earthquakes are breaking out. We've had four earthquakes above six point. We had a seven pointer. Um, the Philippines is active. Um, our super volcanoes are a little more active. I still cannot identify the relationship between planetary alignments and volcanic activity. But I will tell you and have discovered the relationship between tectonic activity, which means the plate shifting, and planetary alignments. It's simply change in motion. You know, when a rubber band snaps, wherever that rubber band is attached to, that object is going to shift and move. Along the west coast of Antarctica, excuse me, the west coast of South America, we had six pointer, but yet in the Panama, we had a six pointer. Um, and we had some bizarre quakes, um, but notice the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Look it. We had a large body alignment and no earthquakes in the Mid Atlantic Ridge. That has been, until now, almost unheard of. Where did all the earthquakes go? The, I mean, during a planetary alignment, I predicted like a dozen earthquakes over two weeks, uh, extending from Iceland down to South America, uh, 10 kilometers depth, uh, averaging three to five ma in magnitudes. I mean, that was made in February 2012, that prediction, because of a planetary alignment. And now we're having a planetary alignment and no earthquakes. But then when we look at some of the larger quakes, uh, the Philippines, um, we were trying to tunnel through the earth and see if there was a wobble. Well, there's almost no earthquakes off the coast of Brazil. Um, and in the, and actually, this is not the Philippines, I'm so sorry. Um, this is an active area that has three tectonic plates that meet south of Japan and due east of the Philippines. This is a very active region. And when you tunnel through a very active region, you come out where there should be another very active region, which is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But look, both of those regions, when you see the earthquake map, have gone silent. So this screams that this is a wobble. It's a new wobble. Oh my goodness. And, and the nodes of that wobble, the, the point that is moving the least, is right here these longitudinal plates so that means our our, our wobble is probably longitudinal and that the biggest stress is going to be applied to, to plates that run slightly horizontal creating the greatest shifting in motion now take take a sphere pinch it with your middle finger take an orange a golf ball whatever pinch it with your thumb and middle finger spin that golf ball towards you face it towards you the part of the golf ball that is moving the greatest is the part facing you. The part that's moving the least is where your thumb and your middle finger reside. Those are called the nodes. So if there was a wobble, we already know what the node is. The node is right here and along a longitudinal plane. Well, if there was a wobble, then other earthquakes would have polar opposite because you know, what's happening on one side of the sphere is happening on the other side. The same stressors would apply if the tectonic plates existed polar opposite of one another. 
Um, Panama had a large quake, greater than six, right off the coast of Panama. So let's tunnel through Panama and see, you know, what comes out and where. And you'll see Panama has a polar opposite earthquake. off the coast of Sumatra. That's where the tectonic plates reside. A lot of volcanism in that area, but it, it, it almost matches up perfectly. You know, if the faults don't match up perf perfectly, you're gonna see a near vicinity uh, when tunneling through the earth. But sometimes you tunnel through the epicenter, you come out through another epicenter, which is, you know, you would think the odds of that happening three times, four times in a week would be infinitesimally small but not today. Papua New Guinea, a big quake happening there. So what's, you know, what's the polar opposite of Papua New Guinea? Well, the polar opposite of Papua New Guinea is a place in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge area. Well, the, and it's actually not even the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it's the coast of Brazil. The coast of Brazil is notoriously quiet. There's almost never an earthquake off the coast of Brazil. So New Guinea is about the only quake that does not have a polar opposite, but the Panama quake did. So what else? What other big quakes are we seeing? Well, we already covered the Panama quake. So, but in South America, in Peru, they had a six-pointer that was downgraded. Also in Brazil, they had an inland quake. It's very rare for it to occur there, but they had an inland quake that was approaching 6.0. So let's tunnel through both of these quakes and see what we find. The Brazil quake, we come out in the Philippines. And so we were like, okay, that's cool. Well, what happened in the Philippines? Philippines had a huge quake. So directly opposite side of the earth, even on a vertical plate, we see uh, significant earthquake activity. Um, this means there must be a wobble, a new wobble. Um, th look at the Brazil quake. Uh, the Brazil quake uh, slightly inland. S so where does this occur? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It wasn't Panama. It was the Brazil quake that had the polar opposite in the Philippines. The Philippine quake was a big quake. And the quake in Brazil is a place that almost never has earthquakes this far inland of Brazil. But yet, there it is. There it was. That quake in just inside the border of Peru, north of Bolivia, in Brazil. So that's pretty bizarre. So the Papua New Guinea quake did not have a polar opposite. Um, which, but it was a volcanic quake. That's a volcanic island. Mon so much volcanism going on in that area. It's crazy. But, you know, South Peru, there was a quake that was downgraded. That quake, again, the opposite of that quake, popped up in China. So you, you tunnel through the Peru quake. So my, my images are out of order, so that's kind of getting me a little frustrated. But so the, the China quake uh, was opposite, was opposite of the quake in Peru, uh, which which is a, a, almost a polar opposite. And there's a Kamchatka quake. Big quake, larger than 6.0, occurring in Kamchatka. The polar opposite is south of South America and just north of the Antarctic Peninsula. So we go down to south and we find, uh, again, way south, we have, once again, a polar opposite quake way down way down south of South America, almost through the Drake Passage. So that, that's just 
amazing that we have what five quakes four quakes that have polar opposites and at the same time some of our most active regions went silent during during a a planetary alignment off to your left notice that big quake in Sumatra that had a polar opposite the quake in the Philippines had a polar opposite New Guinea did not that was the only large quake that did not have a polar opposite so so what's happened either there's a third body in the solar system that is now becoming geoeffective and that is that is a possibility um, that we're part of a tertiary system NASA had disclosures about tertiary systems I, like and we knew they existed but we're wondering why are you making such a formal a uh, big deal about discovering a tertiary system that really is not any different than other ter tertiary systems that we require its own, you know, its own piece on 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 a documentary or an announcement. Um, but the other thing is, is that we could have broken the connection between Planet X and Earth. Right now, Earth is moving away from Planet X, and Planet X is moving away from Earth. It is the fastest point of separation of relative speed occurring right now as earth is moving away from planet x and planet x is moving away from earth and as you can see that there's a, a strong magnetic force a weak magnetic force you can call it strong gra gravitational force weak gravitational force one diminishes by distance squared the other diminishes by distance cubed so that the further you get away, the faster your magnetic field or gravitational field falls off. It is a exponential relationship from distance to magnetic field. It's amazing. But here's a graph that shows you how, you know, the further you get away, how quickly that force will fall off, both in, in, in distance squared for one magnetic force and distance cubed for the weaker magnetic force. Uh, excuse me, the stronger magnetic force. So, so the magnetism will fall off quick and the gravitational tidal influence will fall off quick. And as Earth moves away in such high speed, that could have let go, creating a snap or a wobble. That wobble then would shift our plates, but only in the areas that are experiencing the greatest motion, and not in the areas that are experiencing the least motion. So the nodes of that wobble have to be somewhere along the, the Atlantic Ocean and somewhere along uh, the the tri the tri plate meeting off south of Japan in the Pacific Ocean. We look at the weather and we see we see that system they're plunging into California at incredible speed well there there seems to be some evaporation of moisture but you know again that moisture that's coming in usually comes from the equator or, or and but now it's not it's it's actually been pulled up drawn up far out over Siberia cycled and brought back down as these systems move in to the USA uh, that's quite incredible. So the hot rain is a little late in showing up, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of glad, but I'm worried that you know this snowpack gets deeper and deeper. Then in April, one hot rain, and all things will change. It will be catastrophe. It will be broken levees. It will be record crop losses in some areas, not everywhere. It will be homes being lost. It'll be people being displaced. It's going to happen in April. And the Ohio River may do the same thing. So until next time, be prepared, not scared.